My name is Patrick White, and I'm going to speak to you about dissolving a practice. Of course, there are many different fact patterns that arise in terms of dissolving a practice. Some of them are good, such as retirement, relocation, joining another practice, or maybe even a change of career. Others, on the other hand, are uh, unfortunate in nature, such as illness or death. Today I'm going to try to talk about some general guidelines that will apply to one degree or another all of those various topics. The American Medical Association has published guidelines and uh, what they call seven steps to closing a practice. I'm going to use those guidelines and talk about them today with you. I'll also talk about some other topics that uh, I think are as uh, important as, as the seven steps or are good to know in addition to the seven steps. The first area I wanted to speak with you about is uh, your employees. Obviously, the success of any practice and institution depends on its employees. And uh, as with all of us, it's important that employees uh, get as much advance notification as possible of a practice closing so that they can try to find other work. But from the perspective of you as the physician or from the perspective of the practice, it's also necessary to keep key employees until the practice has been wound down. In order to do that, it might be necessary to offer the key employee or employees an incentive to stay until the end. Uh, that creates a win-win situation both for you and the employee. Additionally, it's important for you to review the employee retirement plans, health care plans, and also to pay any unused employee benefits such as vacation time and sick leave. The next uh, topic is medical records, and this is very important, of course, for the patient, and it can be important for those who unfortunately might face a medical malpractice lawsuit after a practice uh, has been dissolved or after you move on to a different uh, career or different practice. So you must retain records according to state retention laws as well as federal laws such as Medicare and Medicaid, if it's applicable. Now, with respect to maintaining and storing records, you can uh, personally archive them if you have the uh, storage facility to do so, or if you have the expertise with respect to electronic health records. Alternatively, uh, if you are selling your practice, you could arrange with the buyer to keep the records, or alternatively, enter into an agreement with a commercial storage firm. Now, if you, whatever arrangement you decide to, to use, you should make sure there's a written agreement that includes confidentiality terms and compliance with applicable law such as HIPAA. The next point is to, of course, only provide patients with copies of records. That is probably self-evident to you, but I just wanted to emphasize that you should never give the original to the patient. You should also have a method of honoring record requests. Obviously, with a transition, there'll be many requests by patients for records to be transferred to a new physician or practice, or alternatively, they might simply ask for a copy themselves. Although physicians may charge for copying records, the AMA recommends that uh, you provide the records free of charge, but it is your discretion. With respect to state law, there is a statute that sets forth the requirements for retention of records. If the patient is an adult, the record should be kept for at least six years after the last date of service. If the patient is a child, on the other hand, the record should be kept for at least three years after the child's 18th birthday or for at least six years after the last date of service, whichever occurs later. Importantly, uh, when a health care provider, according to state law and the statute that uh, you see on the screen, retires or sells his or her practice, the physician must take reasonable steps to ensure that his or her records, patient records, are retained pursuant to this section. That's important because if an issue arose with respect to records, it would not be a valid defense to state that it was not your responsibility as the physician 
because by state law it actually is your responsibility and therefore you should make sure that you personally take reasonable steps to ensure the records are kept. I also mentioned that occasionally uh, a physician after leaving a practice faces a lawsuit and if for some reason records pertinent to that patient's care are missing, uh, the patient's lawyers uh, will often quote state law in an effort to have the judge instruct the jury to reach an adverse inference with respect to the missing or lost records. So for your own protection, it is important to maintain those records with respect to the potential for litigation. Also, I should tell you that Medicare and Medicaid have requirements. According to federal law, the record should be kept for at least 10 years uh, if it's a Medicare or Medicaid patient. So keep that in mind as well. Also, HIPAA has, I believe, a six-year requirement, but if state law is more uh, strict or requires longer retention of the records, you should comply with state law, of course, or vice versa. Always err on the side of caution and keep the records for the longest applicable time frame. The next issue is notifying patients of the dissolution of a practice or of your movement from the practice to, as we talked about at the outset, either a change in your career or movement to a new practice or perhaps joining a hospital. Patients should be notified in advance if possible. Of course, there are some precipitous reasons such as sudden illness or death that might change the analysis, but for those of you planning on closing the practice, please give at least three months notice prior to closure, especially with respect to active patients. Patients should receive letters from you, and with respect to high-risk patients, it's a good idea to send registered mail to those patients. The letter should have the closing date, where the records will be stored, and how the patient can obtain copies. A release of information form should be enclosed so that the patient can assign his or her permission or authority for the practice to move the records to the new physician. It should have deadlines, and by that I don't mean a deadline where the patient can't receive a record, but perhaps while the practice is winding down, you might tell the patient that the practice will be open until X date, and during that time send records requests to a certain person. And then after that point, if you've arranged for someone else to retain the records, who the patient can then speak with. Also, you should provide sources for a new physician, if applicable, and also a source for emergency care. Now, it's important for you to keep a copy of that patient letter in your file, I'm sorry, in the patient's chart, so uh, as to memorialize your communication to the patient. Here is a sample letter from the AMA. As you can see, it has the announcement of why the physician is discontinuing the practice. In this letter, they suggest, obviously, the patient assuming care with another physician, and they give sources for the patient to consult with respect to identifying a physician. In a very conscientious move, the AMA suggests reminding the patient to check with their health insurer to make sure that the physician uh, is part of the plan. They talk about emergency medical care and, of course, how to obtain records. Now, of course, uh, many of you will have had uh, long and good relationships with your patients. I encourage you to tailor the letter to your personality and add uh, anything to the letter that you might wish with respect to encouragement to the patient or a thank you for the patient's loyalty to you. The next slide that I have prepared uh, has a sample authorization for release of protected health information. Undoubtedly, all of you have seen such a form. This one I have added to the presentation simply because I think it's user-friendly. And of course, with respect to medicine, as it is with law, it's important to make things understandable from the perspective of a patient. So such a form is very helpful and should be included in your letter to the patient. And then the next slide that I've included is a sample press release. Now, this particular press release 
had more to do, as you can see, with a newspaper press release. But in this day and age, uh, the Internet is, for many of us, the go-to place to find information. It would be helpful, and I would recommend that you post on the Internet information about your practice being closed or about your transition to another location or another entity. And that way, if for some reason a patient does not get the mail uh, or the letter you sent to the patient or doesn't read it, they have another source of information about the status of your practice. And I would include in there, uh, as this press release has, information about who to contact in the event uh, the patient needs additional information. Other notifications uh, that should be made uh, moving on from the patients include the Arizona Medical Board, of course, other state boards where you are licensed, the DEA, your professional associations, major health insurance carriers, your referring physicians, and you should notify MICA. And with respect to notifying MICA, as you can see in the slide, I've referenced uh, tail coverage, which is something I will talk about in detail in a moment. The financial part of the practice is obviously extremely important. You're going to want to work out payment plans with patients as they come in the office for visits during the time period uh, that you were winding down, meaning from the moment that you decide to close until the close date. You might want to arrange with another physician to collect remaining accounts uh, receivable for a percentage or a fixed fee if you're selling the practice. You will need to send collection letters probably to some patients or uh, use a collection agency. And if there's any uh, insurers that owe you money, you're going to want to send a letter requesting payment and the AMA has an example of that. With respect to physicians who are part of a practice and are, well, either employees or owners, you want to look at your operating agreement or shareholder agreement to see what financial compensation you're entitled to when you leave the practice because that document will undoubtedly govern. With respect to physicians who are part of a practice and are, well, either employees or owners, you want to look at your operating agreement or shareholder agreement to see what financial compensation you're entitled to when you leave the practice because that document will undoubtedly govern. I also wanted to let you know, as uh, is shown on the next slide, uh, that when a professional uh, corporation has a member uh, or a shareholder who dies or if it's an entity that dissolves, and the shares aren't purchased, the professional corporation is required to buy the voting shares back. And it also references the shareholder becoming a disqualified person, which relates to the inability of the physician to practice medicine from that point forward. Also, with respect to the professional corporation, the statute governs what you need to do if you're no longer going to use your corporation as a professional corporation, and uh, you have to delete references to it being a professional corporation, and you can still maintain the corporation as a non-professional corporation if you so choose. I show you these not so much uh, so that you have to memorize or even understand them in any detail, but I want you to know there are formalities required under state law which you will have to address. Of course, uh, for any type of sophisticated closing, uh, you may want to consult a lawyer uh, so that you make sure you comply with all the applicable laws. Likewise, with a professional limited liability company, which is an entity frequently used in the practice of medicine, there's a state law that provides for distributions following death, insanity, bankruptcy, retirement, etc., with respect to someone who has an interest in the limited liability company. And uh, with respect to the distributions that they refer to in, in 29707, there is a law that provides for distributions if the limited liability company continues to function now, while distributions are made to other uh, remaining members or alternatively upon the professional limited liability company being wound down. 
and uh, to, to sort of highlight that these things can result in litigation. I am familiar uh, with at least one uh, lawsuit that went up on appeal that dealt with the distributions that the surviving spouse was entitled to under this statute, but not given by the remaining members of the limited liability company. So uh, when there is a dispute, uh, you do need to consult state law. There are also, as with professional corporations, law or laws relating to the dissolution of the professional limited liability company. Of course, that can cease to exist at the time of events specified in the operating agreement or articles of organization. Written consent by a certain number of the members. Uh, when a dispute arises, there is a mechanism for judicial or administrative dissolution or, of course, withdrawal of the last remaining member. I haven't put the uh, complete statute here, but this gives you an idea. Also, with respect to tail coverage, this is an important point, as you can see from the slide. So when a physician uh, has a, their malpractice policy terminated or they cancel it or it expires and they, for example, in this hypothetical, leave a practice or retire, it's important to make sure that you talk to MICA about whether you need tail coverage. If uh, you are sued after your policy period has ended and you do not have tail coverage, you will personally be required to pay defense costs and if there is a verdict or award against you, you would have to pay that uh, with your uh, own money, so to speak. Tail coverage, on the other hand, is a way to extend your malpractice coverage so that even after your original policy has ended or policy period has ended, the tail coverage provides you with a policy that will pay your defense fees or a verdict. Of course, the policies differ, and I'm sure there are different options, but you should uh, obtain tail coverage for your own protection. By way of example, I represented two physicians without tail coverage both were sued with respect to patients who were paralyzed, and uh, the patients alleged the paralysis was as a result of negligence. These physicians were in uh, distress because of the cost of the attorney's fees that they had to pay to, de to defend themselves, and because of the uncertainty surrounding whether they might end up with a large award against them, which could possibly drive them into bankruptcy. So I would highly recommend uh, tail coverage for you, if applicable. And again, please consult Micah about that. The next uh, area that I'd like to address is non-competition agreements. A non-competition agreement, of course, is a contract restricting the right of an employee to compete with an employer after termination of employment. These will be enforced if they are not unreasonable in their limitations and there is not bad faith or a contravening public policy involved. In the physician context, the physician-patient or doctor-patient relationship is considered special and entitled to unique protection. Therefore, courts will strictly construe the agreement for reasonableness. In other words, there's a heightened scrutiny of the agreement because of the unique and special interests involved in the physician-patient relationship. A restriction uh, will not be enforced if the restraint is greater than necessary to protect the employer's legitimate interests or if the employer's interest is outweighed by the hardship to the employee or potential or likely injury to the public. By way of example, the courts found a non-competition agreement reasonable in a case where a physician had formed an urgent care corporation, meaning a corporation, of course, that provided or that ran urgent care centers. The non-competition agreement provided that uh, at the time of his uh, leaving this corporation, he could not practice in an urgent care center for 18 months. In a 
25 mile radius of any location where the Urgent Care Corporation had conducted business for the prior two years. Now that, uh, given the size of the particular Urgent Care Corporation uh, employer, could have been a problem, but the court noted that this physician was an emergency medicine physician and could still practice in emergency departments. The court also noted that the physician was compensated quite well, actually, by the former company. And therefore, the court found this agreement was reasonable. And as you can tell from the example, there actually was not any evidence, or at least significant evidence, that the patients would be negatively impacted by this agreement. In contrast, a non-competition agreement was found to be unreasonable, where the agreement prohibited a pulmonologist from providing any and all forms of medical care. The agreement was for three years, uh, although pulmonology often involved treating patients with chronic conditions who needed to see their pulmonologist at least once every six months, and where the geographic area was 235 miles, which would preclude those patients from, as a practical matter, easily seeing this particular physician. So given that particular agreement, the court found the agreement to be unenforceable. Now, I've given you an example of one that has been found reasonable and one that was not found reasonable, but the important lesson for you is that when you uh, join an employer who suggests entering into a non-competition agreement, you should actually, uh, notwithstanding what might be your anxiousness or excitement about joining the company, you should try to negotiate that to make sure that you could picture yourself living with that agreement if and when uh, you parted ways with that employer. Because often uh, at the end of the relationship, there is uh, when a disagreement arises, uh, some acrimony, and the cost of litigating these agreements is significant. So it's always better to deal with them up front if possible. The next area has to do, as you can see from the slide, with indemnification. If you're the seller of a practice, you may have to indemnify the buyer with respect to losses and liabilities that occurred before the sale. And I should say indemnification is a principle by which essentially someone else or another entity agrees to pay your defense costs or any verdict or reward or loss that arises from a dispute. So moving back to the next example, the buyer of a practice, on the other hand, may have to indemnify and hold the seller harmless for things that occur post-sale. And if you're part of a group, uh, you may want to see whether your contract includes indemnification that survives retirement, death, or withdrawal from the company. The next slide uh, contains an example of this, and um, I, it's as you can see, it's a number of sentences and detailed, but what I liked about this was it required the providers to maintain professional malpractice coverage insurance and also uh, to obtain tail coverage if applicable. And as I mentioned with uh, my presentation on tail coverage, uh, it is of great advantage to the practitioner if there is an existing insurance policy which provides coverage. That is the best protection against financial distress from a potential lawsuit. Moving along to other practice dissolution steps, of course, winding down requires wrapping up the business end of things, notifying creditors, paying your debts, liabilities, and obligation, and distributing property and funds to members. Many of you will have a financial advisor or someone within the company that handles the financial things, and you will want to make sure that you have addressed all outstanding obligations. So in summary, uh, I'll just uh, run down this again so that you have a global idea of the things necessary upon closing a practice or moving a practice. You should notify your employees, arrange for medical record retention, notify your patients, the Arizona Board of Medical Examiners, MICA, professional associations, and gather or collect accounts receivable sell or dispose of office equipment, and 
make sure that you have the necessary insurance malpractice coverage in place and that any unnecessary insurance is canceled. There are a number of resources you can use. The AMA, as I mentioned at the beginning, is a great source. MICA is another source, as is the FDA and the AHIMA. So with that, I'll end my presentation. Thank you for attending, and if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer them. Thanks, Patrick. We have a number of questions been sent in. The first one is, uh, our group is dissolving. Members of the group are retiring, joining another group, or entering employment with the hospital system. We're trying to determine how to handle the medical records currently handled by the group. Are there some guidelines or rules to help us determine what to do with the medical records once the group is dissolved? As I mentioned, the most important guidelines are those provided by state and federal law in terms of the length of medical record retention and with regard to it being the responsibility of the physician to take reasonable steps to maintain the records according to applicable law. In terms of uh, storing the records as a practical matter, as I mentioned, you can enter into agreements with a practice or perhaps with a hospital or alternatively with a commercial storage facility. If you Google storage of medical records, you'll see a number of companies will be identified in response to your query and are willing to store and in some cases manage medical records that are being stored by them. So that uh, hopefully will be helpful with respect to that question. Another question, my business partner and I are considering ending our partnership after 30 years. My partner wants to sell? I do not. Should we have entered into a buy-sell agreement when I started my partnership? I uh, do recommend that uh, physicians have a buy-sell agreement when they start a partnership. As with anything in life, it's better to address possible contingencies or outcomes earlier rather than later, especially because at the beginning there are usually two parties who are getting along amicably and uh, therefore uh, it's often more rash or they often act more rationally in uh, deciding on a mutually acceptable agreement. With regard to whether to sell or I'm sorry with regard to the question of your partner, wanting to sell and you not wanting to sell, uh, one option, of course, is for you to explore the possibility of buying your partner out and maintaining the partnership. And the next question. My partner and I are experiencing a deteriorating business relationship. Due to loans and such, we have to remain together as a business for at least two more years. Who could help us with this kind of situation? The, this next question is, uh, the answer to it is largely dependent upon uh, where the relationship between you and your partner is uh, at present. If it's still somewhat amicable, you may want to consult uh, jointly a financial advisor or a lawyer for the partnership, meaning the entity, in order to help both of you uh, coexist for the remaining time you have together. Of course, if you and your partner uh, reach a point of conflict uh, that is uh, great or goes beyond the ability for you two to work together, it may be necessary for each of you to retain your own lawyer. Of course, that's the least desirable option. It's always better to try to resolve these things if you can without incurring that kind of expense. And the next question. My physician business partner has passed away. Do I have to legally dissolve the partnership? Can I buy his share? What do I have to do? Depending on the type of entity you and your partner have created, you, uh, as mentioned earlier in the presentation, will have an option to buy his shares and you may be able to maintain the partnership after your partner's death. In terms of what you have to do, you should 
take a look at the specific structure of the corporation and then consult state law on your options. It may be uh, wise to at least consult an attorney if only for an hour or two to make sure that if you're going to do it by yourself, uh, you're moving in the right direction. Or alternatively, if the partnership is significant enough to warrant it, you may want to retain a lawyer to help you go through the steps of maintaining your partnership and buying his shares. And another question we've had, Patrick, just to be clear, are billing records part of the medical record? I do consider billing records to be a part of the of the medical record, even though they're sometimes kept separately. Uh, although I admit that I haven't uh, read a particular case or statute on that, but uh, I would advise that you keep your billing records along with the medical records or the uh, notes of your evaluation of the patient. Okay, moving on. When you only sell the assets and goodwill of the practice to your new employer, but retain the stock and operation of the corporation, uh, are there any general thoughts on this? This question concerning assets and goodwill being sold but retaining the stock and operation of the corporation is a interesting one. I, I don't have any uh, general thoughts uh, to give you uh, with so little information, but uh, obviously I uh, would suspect that you have consulted a lawyer and have an operating agreement, and hopefully uh, this will be advantageous to both of you. And the next question. If one provider is leaving a larger group to join a competitor, how much contact information should be disclosed? I think uh, this considers the non-solicitation clause existing in a, in a shareholder agreement. If there is a non-solicitation clause in the shareholder agreement, you should consult that clause, uh, obviously, in regard to how much information to provide to patients when when a physician is leaving a larger group to join a competitor. At the uh, same time, though, the patient's rights should be considered paramount to be aware of their physician or other health care provider leaving so that they have the option of uh, choosing where they obtain their medical care. And the next question. As an employed physician, are you responsible for maintaining records when leaving a practice or hospital, or is it the employer's responsibility? Whether the uh, employed physician uh, should be responsible for maintaining records depends, as a practical matter, on the agreement with the practice or the hospital. In terms of a hospital or a practice, uh, it's often the case that they will maintain the records and uh, strictly comply with state and federal law. To comply with your responsibility, I would recommend you simply confirm that the practice or the hospital will maintain the records, and by doing so, uh, you will be acting reasonably and fulfilling your obligation to make sure that the patient's records are maintained. Okay. After closing your practice, how many times are you required to provide copies of patient records for any single patient? Can you charge after providing a certain number of copies? You are allowed to charge uh, a reasonable fee for providing copies of records to patients. And if the patient's patient is requesting the record uh, on multiple occasions, you can charge for that as well. Although, as I mentioned at the outset, when a practice is closing, the AMA recommends that you do not charge the patient, at least for the initial copy. And the final question, Patrick. Where can a practice go to find out how to sell a practice? There are many sources uh, for information about how to sell a practice. You can consult law firms who will help. There are also brokers that provide assistance in valuing a practice and help sell the practice. And there are also other professionals such as accountants that provide assistance. My suggestion would be to go online and enter a search for 
information about selling a medical practice, I think you'll find that there's plenty of information about who to seek out in such a case. That's great. Thank you very much, Patrick, for joining us today. Good to see you again. I'll just to remind you that we have two upcoming webinars. Uh, one September the 20th at Lunch and Learn. We talk about the Office of Civil Rights, HIPAA, privacy issues. And October 18th, Lunch and Law, EMR litigation update. See you then.